Good afternoon and welcome to another Turnstile Tours virtual program. I'm Stefan D.W. coming to you from Flushing, Queens. And today we are going to talk about something that uh, can be found in every borough in New York City and uh, is not very well known. We're going to talk about tide mills. Of course, these days tide power is uh, coming back and uh, into uh, focus. Uh, there have been some really big experiments in uh, Scotland. They're testing uh, tide, uh, tide power generators. And we have a tide power generation uh, project happening uh, right here in the East River as well. So uh, this is a, an old technology that really shaped New York City that is uh, back with us uh, today and uh, increasingly a part of our future uh, power uh, uh, before we get back into, uh, so before we take on all the, the tides, let's uh, bring in Brad Vogel and uh, welcome you back. Last time you were here, you were talking about the Gowanus Canal, and uh, I gather you're joining us from over near the Gowanus Canal today. Yes, great to be here, chiming in from not, not more than a long stone's throw from the Gowanus Canal. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and... You, uh, I brought you in because, well, the Gowanus, of course, is a, a major site of Tide Mills, uh, but uh, also you're associated with a couple of uh, organizations, one in particular that's focused on Tide Mills. What, what can you tell us about that organization? Sure. So I happen to be somehow or another a member of the Tide Mill Institute. Now, this is an organization that was started uh, not all that long ago in Boston, and then really its sort of center of focus shifted up to Maine and a lot of its membership, but it's now actually starting to sort of expand a bit beyond New England, and it's a really interesting group of some diehard molinologists, because that molinology is apparently the study of mills, as I have come to know. <laughs> um, but it's people who really find all the different strands that you can pull out from these tide mills to be quite interesting. And I've certainly come to know some really great people and some really dedicated researchers and some very creative minds through that organization. Great. Well, let's uh, take a quick look at some uh, photos and sort of talk about what tide mills are and, and uh, how they operate and, uh, and get into that here. So, so what are we looking at here? What, what, are, what are these tide mills? Sure. So and um, these are tide mills from around New York City. It's really important to note that these were in all five boroughs of what is today New York City. And we're talking about structures that were built from the early 1600s up through the early 1800s. And they were around on the landscape. And when we're talking about a tide mill, we're talking both about the structures you're seeing here, which is the actual mill building, but then also the mill ponds that were crucial to making them work. Um, they were around on the landscape in the city up until the 1920s and 30s um, in some cases. Uh, but what you're seeing here is buildings that are quite old by the time that photography comes around. You know, they were old in many cases at the time of the American Revolution, which is crazy to think. Um, but this is some of the very first industrial based activity in New York City. As I recall, uh, there are a lot of the early images of New Amsterdam, you see a big windmill, basically where the custom house is today, near where, where uh, the fort was in, in New Amsterdam. Uh, but uh, uh, I've read in places that, you know, there were, tide, there were so many tide mills here that the Dutch really looked at uh, New Netherlands as a milling center. And, uh, you know, we think of, we talk a lot about New York's industrial history, but uh, we think of that as being uh, coal powered and, and steam powered and uh, eventually electricity powered. Uh, uh, but uh, but you know, there was this whole other uh, sustainable, uh, renewable resource of, of tide power. And of course, here we have regular tides twice a day uh, that are predictable. So, so this, is a, this is a great uh, uh, way of powering a city. Right, yeah, Stephen, I like to think that on the seal of the city of New York, you know, we have a beaver and you have a windmill and you have barrels of flour. I do think that the barrels of flour really symbolically come from the tide mills rather than the windmills because the windmills, as you pointed out, were not nearly as reliable um, as the tides. Absolutely. 
Yeah, so here we are looking at New York City, and uh, folks watching, uh, feel free to, to chime in on the chat there. Andrew's dropped a few interesting comments and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, links into the chat, so check those out. But here we are looking at New York City, reminding once, ourselves once again that we have this vast waterfront, uh, that uh, and the tides are very complicated. Uh, living in Flushing, I've, I've been struck that there are times when I'll uh, leave, I'll get on the seven train, cross over uh, Flushing Bay here, and it'll be low tide. And by the time I get off the seven train at uh, the Hudson, uh, it's not that so much time has passed, but the tides are so different that it's high tide over on the Hudson. And uh, we'll talk more later about how that affects the Hellgate here, which connects Long Island Sound and the rest of the harbor. And they have wildly different uh, tidal flows uh, but uh, we've, we've talked in previous programs that the tides in New York Harbor tend to be about five, six feet, pretty regular, not too extreme. They tend to be a little more extreme in Flushing Bay at the long end of Long Island Sound, uh, more like seven or nine or 10 feet. Uh, and, and that plays into the powerful waters of the Hellgate. But we also see all these green areas around here, uh, which are old salt marshes. And areas that aren't green that we know were salt marshes, and, uh, <laughs> which is a great place to put a tide mill. So let's take a look at, oh, right. And we're going to talk about how tide mills operate. Uh, yeah, so uh, I've, uh, growing up in Appalachia, I, I lived around a lot of mills. And so I learned a couple of things. I'll, I'll be the primer on the mills. Uh, you have water wheels that come in three basic varieties. Uh, the more dramatic and attractive looking ones where you have a channel of water that goes over the wheel and drops the water on the wheel, very powerful water wheel. It's the overshot wheel. Uh, you'll also see water wheels, uh, uh, mills that are run with water that drops in the middle of the wheel. It's called a breast wheel, also pretty powerful. Uh, but with tide mills, we're rarely dealing with water that it runs that high. So we're almost always looking at undershot water wheels with water flowing below. And, and this is probably the more most technically complicated thing we've got to get into today. Uh, the way they operate, the tide comes up uh, and there's a berm separating the ocean and the estuary from a mill pond. So they have gates in the berm that open as the tide comes up. And when uh, the tide stops rising, those gates close and then they open a gate in front of the mill wheel. And that allows the water that's built up behind that berm and those gates to flow out. And uh, going through a constricted passage, it'll take longer for the water behind the berm to uh, go under the mill wheel than it will for the uh, tide to ebb that creates a big pressure difference and runs your mill. So we're gonna start in, uh, in my neighborhood here. This is a uh, tide mill in, uh, in, well, almost on the edge of flushing. What uh, what can you tell us about this uh, this mill here, uh, Brad? Yeah, no, I this I, I have to confess this is one that I know a little bit less about, and that is one thing you'll see when you start diving in and try to research tide mills in New York City or really anywhere in, along the U.S. East Coast is that there are a lot of gaps. And that's, to me, that's exciting because I was finding tide mills during preparation for this show that people at the Tide Mill Institute did not yet have in their overall database. And to me, that's exciting because that means there's hunting to be done. And I would put this College Point Mill in that category. <laughs> yeah, no, this is one I've, I've, even though it's just down the street, I, I kind of knew there were uh, you know, tidal areas uh, and uh, that uh, were near here and tide mills around here. Uh, this is one I found on a map as we're preparing. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at uh, what that looks like today. But you yourself, can anybody who's watching, you know, look at old maps, you'll dig up tide mills. Any, any place there's a, a tidal marsh, you'll uh, uh, you know, look carefully at those maps. You see a large area of water within the tide marsh that may be a mill pond and that will, uh, uh, help you find old tide mills. Uh, Peter wants to know, did any mills also operate powered by both the incoming and outgoing tide? 
And uh, we're, I, I'm not, or do you, do you, you know for sure about that? Probably we were speculating about that with one particular one before. Uh, do, you, do you know of any ones for sure that operated on both tides? Yeah, I, I myself am not familiar with any specific one, but in my conversations with folks at the Tide Mill Institute, I do believe that there were some developed later on, because obviously it's a bit more complicated. Um, but I know that it was, in some cases, they literally would just have different sets of valves and different types of wheels within one tide mill structure that would, would attempt to take advantage of the flows going both ways. Um, as it was, if you had just a traditional tide mill um, running just on the water going out at uh, low tide in the main channel, you could run that for roughly six hours, two times a day, you know, once for each high tide essentially. And, and it was, you know, in terms of sort of the labor of the miller, uh, they were certainly people who kept odd hours during harvest time because you could only run your mill during those six hour or so windows when the tide had filled your, your mill pond. And of course that shifts around as the, as right. the moon shifts. So uh, you're, you're, it's a little bit like milking cows and that you're on opposite ends of the day, but your opposite ends of the day shift with the moon. So it might be at 4 a.m. or yes. it might be at midnight. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, it's a, that is a very curious lifestyle. Well, let's take a look at this, uh, at this particular mill in uh, College Point. I'm going to sort of reorient my screen here. Uh, so for those of you at all familiar with Flushing, we're looking at the Flushing Creek here. Flushing Bay is off to the left. And hang on a second, Oop, go back to that. There we go. Uh, and this, what's called Broadway, we now call Northern Boulevard. This is Union Street, so Flushing High School is here. And sort of downtown Flushing, you can see with the density of buildings. In fact, I'm sitting right over here under the word mill. So over here, uh, up in this area, that's where the uh, New York Police Academy is. Our, our former colleague uh, uh, just graduated from there. And, uh, uh, and we see this huge mill pond on a creek that is largely underground today. Uh, and take a look here. This is what that looks like today. Uh, so that's the uh, Whitestone Expressway going over College Point Boulevard. And, uh, uh, and it's here- almost exactly, It's almost exactly the same, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a big, big thoroughfare. Uh, and City Field, which was uh, off the map, otherwise it would have appeared there. Uh, City Field off there in the back right of this image with the mouth of the creek, uh, which used to have a tide mill on. And uh, more in Flushing, uh, actually I was, uh, a great resource for learning more about the water's edge in New York City is a blog uh, called uh, Hidden Waters Blog. There's a parks employee called uh, Sergei Kadinsky who wrote a book called Hidden Waters of New York. And uh, he happened by the house the other day and we were talking about he's still trying to locate precisely where uh, in the uh, Queens Botanical Garden this uh, mill was located, but that's about where the Queens Botanical Garden is today. And then over here, we have another mill in, on the edge of Corona Park. And uh, again, that's highway today, uh, the, where I believe the Grand Central Parkway. No, it's uh, one of those, I mix up all the highways, but it's a major highway interchange over there. Here, we're looking at LaGuardia, uh, what is now LaGuardia. And we have uh, another grist mill noted here, again, going into Flushing Bay. All this has been filled in uh, with airplanes on top of it now. And uh, off to Manhattan. I know there's a, there's a lot more to Queens, and uh, I was surprised I didn't see more tide mills on maps in Jamaica Bay in the Queens part, but uh, uh, they may uh, lie yet to be discovered. Uh, but uh, let's let's talk about uh, Manhattan and uh, tide mills there. Yes, no, and this is a great great image. I'm really glad this is here. This is McCombs Dam, and today people might know this as the bridge over the river at 155th Street going between Manhattan and the Bronx, but it was a highly controversial uh, tide mill um, in addition to being a bridge. And it caused all sorts of havoc with navigation on the Harlem River. Uh, but crucially, it was a tide mill that was serving, you know, from what I read, 
they were actually using it um, to cut marble, um, which was oh, not, wow. not, yeah, which was not something that I had heard about tide mills doing anywhere else. Um, but tide mills seem to, to come into play doing a whole bunch of interesting things, including grinding bark to be yep. to release the tannins for use in tanneries. Um, you know, some, some parts of processes that today we don't necessarily think of because they've been made synthetic or they are sort of completely changed processes. Um, but yeah, Stefan, I don't know if you have anything further on this one, uh, but that... Just to point out that the high bridge is there in the background. That, that, that's probably my favorite thing about this image is that it contextualizes McCombs Den with uh, the, the high bridge in the background. And, and to add to your comments, you know, I grew up near Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where uh, they had a couple of, uh, a whole 18th century industrial area that included a, uh, a water pumping station that was water driven and an oil mill. So they were, they were uh, 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 pulping uh, seed from flax plants to hmm. make linseed oil. And so, yeah, it's uh, before steam, water power and water mills were your basic uh, form of energy, and uh, if it wasn't horsepower or manpower, it was uh, water power that was doing all the rotary actions and, and doing all the heavy jobs. So uh, I had not known that about this, uh, uh, the, the marble cutting. That's fantastic. So here we are, another view of that. Here's uh, McCombs Dam way up on the Harlem River. And uh, down here, we, and I should note that we talked about McCombs Dam a bit on our Harlem River tour uh, that we took with Classic Harbor Lines. Uh, but down here, we have the Hellgate, uh, which we mentioned before, and that's a huge source of power that we'll get into more shortly. So Mill Rock, this, is, uh, this was sort of the terror of the Hellgate. Hellgate's notoriously dangerous water. And this was a big part of the, why it was so dangerous. What, what can you tell us about Mill Rock and its uh, tide mill? Sure, yeah. So the image you're seeing here is from likely after the period when it served as the base for one or more tide mills. Uh, this is when it was a fortification during the War of 1812. And so if folks have been up to the blockhouse in the very northern reaches of Central Park, you may be seeing you may have seen one of the sort of sister fortifications from that period. But Essentially, and we, you know, we've had some discussion behind the scenes about this site because it is still there today in a much changed form, Mill Rock. Um, so we don't really necessarily know precisely what it looked like. It looks a little bit more rugged and irregular here than it does today. Uh, we were talking though about given the, the velocity of water that goes through the Hellgate, it's possible that in this location, they didn't even have a mill pond. They might have just had a freestanding wheel going out into the water that was just turned based on the sort of ambient volume of water going by. Um, so more research to be done. But um, there's a couple of places where we see examples where today all it appears to be is a small outcropping of rock in the water. And, you know, patents were granted to multiple people to build mills on this on this small rock. This happened up in the Bronx off of City Island as well. So more research certainly to be done on, on this type of tide mill. But certainly on the maps that I've looked at, uh, it doesn't appear that there's any kind of mill pond here, which speaks to your speculation that uh, they may have just kind of had a, uh, a water wheel in the, uh, in the Hellgate. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may speak to uh, the question we had a minute ago about uh, you know, mills that run both directions. Uh, certainly there's enough velocity in the water in the Hellgate that that seems like a real possibility. Uh, but uh, a yeah, fascinating spot. Uh, but, uh, you know, here, this image I love because it has the channels for navigating the Hellgate. Uh, a lot of the rocks that we see on this picture uh, uh, were removed over the years. Uh, and particularly, uh, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't uh, Mill Rock a, a source of a major explosion? They, uh, one of these rocks, they, they put a lot of gunpowder into and, and blew up at one point. Yes, that's right. And I think it's actually the, what, what looks like the pink um, below the Mill Rock over on the, um, on the Astoria side of this, which I think was the, arguably the largest explosion of any kind up until the atomic bomb. There's at least some claims made um, that when that happened in the 1880s, it, it was, it remained the largest explosion up until 
1945. I'm sure Andrew will correct us uh, on uh, which rock that was, <laughs> but uh, just remarkable here that we have you know, uh, outgoing traffic going one side of uh, the Hellgate and then incoming traffic making this terrible, uh, uh, circuitous route through very fast water. And, uh, and again, we have that huge difference between the tide levels in the harbor and the tide levels in, the, uh, the, in Long Island Sound, you know, creating uh, the, the hazards here and setting up the uh, Mill Rock as, as a great source of water power. And Just, Stephen, I, I, well, there, yeah. Steph, Stephen, before you head out, I did have a little bit of incidental music for the Hellgates. Ah. <laughs> And I say, uh, I, I love that you've uh, brought that in. Of course, uh, your accordion uh, is, is suggests uh, kind of the, the same function we're talking about of valves uh, bringing in, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this case, air and then pressurizing it to, uh, to release. Uh, your accordion is like a, a small uh, a tide mill in itself, an air mill. Yes. All right, so uh, here we are. This is obviously not a historical photo uh, or uh, not very uh, long ago. Uh, so we're, we're still doing uh, tidal energy in the East River today. What, what is this we're looking at here? Yes, so this is actually a fascinating project uh, by Verdant Power. Now this is in the channel between Roosevelt Island and Queens. And this was actually a pilot project to determine what sort of power could be generated from tidal turbines. Now, this is a crucial point. What this program is about today is about tide mills, which was, which was capturing water by and large, except as we discussed, maybe at Mill Rock and maybe one spot in the Bronx, they were using sort of the general flow of the current to turn a tidal mill. But uh, these, these are designed to capture the fast velocity current moving as a result of tides through this channel and this was put in not long ago and it was raised recently and checked and it functioned um, as they had hoped you know i think it was 187 kilowatts and, wow. and i i am not going to say that i am an engineer in terms of the output of of electricity generated but suffice it to say um this could certainly power quite a few homes. Um, and that's just from three turbines in this little test um, plot. Yeah, well, I was reading, I think they, uh, they installed them in October and were uh, checking their uh, uh, performance in January and uh, exceeding expectations was sort of the short story. So we'll, we'll see if we get more of that. If any of you have uh, saw our program on uh, the ferry, it goes up to Astoria. Uh, you will have witnessed uh, how turbid that water is, how fast that water is on this side of Roosevelt Island. So that's a, a great location for taking advantage of tidal power. All right, so on to Brooklyn, uh, getting closer to uh, the area that uh, you're cl most closely located and uh, know best, but uh, this is a beautiful photo of a mill that disappeared relatively not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, this, um, this tide mill is known as Garretson's Mill, and this was a rather old mill from the 1600s, uh, but Crucially, it's, it's well known and it's better documented than most tide mills in New York City because it actually lasted until 1935 when it was destroyed by arson. Um, there are some stories that because there were plans for development of what is today Marine Park, that a possible employee or contact or connection of Robert Moses may have had something to do with it. Unclear whether that's, that's you know, evidenced in the historical record, but uh, the interesting thing that I found was that this mill was actually the subject of a preservation effort. There was a public campaign in the 1920s to get the mill back into shape, to have the city get more involved, and money was actually allocated and work was actually done in the 1920s, uh, and then sadly it burnt in 1935. Um, but one crucial thing, and I think Stefan will get into this, is that it's one of the few tide mills in New York City where you can still actually see tangible physical remnants of the structure to this day. 
Yeah, I had heard that and uh, I went looking for it. So we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, I'll let the, let's jump ahead and see. And since we're talking about that, we'll, we'll take a quick look at uh, the remnants. So uh, I went down to, um, uh, to Marine Park, which is uh, where Garrison Creek is. And uh, can't recommend highly enough. They have a, a, the Parks Department has a concession there, renting out bicycles and also kayaks. And just off the right side of the screen, you get out on a beach and you can kayak out onto uh, the Garrison Creek and even into Jamaica Bay and uh, see all the, the shorebirds and everything. Uh, the pilings you see in the foreground uh, are apparently from part of that development plan in the 30s, a part of a uh, canoe uh, a marina. And then off here, just barely visible, are pilings that I'm told are associated with the, uh, the dam and the tide mill. And uh, frankly, I wouldn't have this photo except that I was into this cat over here who was hunting something. And uh, I, I thought there were other pilings that I'd seen that, that were more likely suspects, but I've been corrected by people who've done better research. And uh, so uh, thank you to the, uh, this tabby uh, for being the reason I have this photo of the, uh, uh, the pilings. And you brought a, uh, you remembered that there was another connection in a museum to uh, the uh, to the to this tide mill, this uh, this hand cart. What what do you know about that? Yes, so that was donated by somebody who lived in the neighborhood to the New York Historical Society, and it was a cart that um, they were estimating somewhere between I think nineteen or eighteen fifty and nineteen fifteen, roughly, uh, that was used to haul barrels and sacks of grain at Garrison's mill. Uh, and interestingly, Stefan, the New York Historical Society also actually has some millstones, which I, again, I did not know until I was preparing for the show. And they seem to be from very early mills where they were buried and dug up down on like the very lower, lower east side um, and sort of Fidei area. So some of those mills, it's a little hard to tell. They were probably windmills. One was a horse mill, which I presume means a horse-powered mill, um, but it's unclear if any of them may or may not have been from some other tide mill that we, again, don't yet know about or don't have documentation for. Now, the other thing that strikes me about these tide mills is so many of the people doing the research are just local enthusiasts. It is very much a neighborhood story. You know, what we know about the, the mill over in Mill Basin, it's a local guy who's really into the local history. And uh, I think, uh, I, I hope the, your Tide Mill Institute organization brings that together and perhaps formalizes it. So let's, let's go back to your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, here we are. Let's talk about the Gowanus. Okay, yes. So Gowanus was certainly a hotbed of Tide Mill activity. And again, it's so interesting to remember that the, you know, the Dutch colonial um, folks who were arriving in these places, they are displacing um, the Lenape, the native inhabitants. But it is interesting in that the tide mills, compared to other industry that comes along later, are much more in tune with the natural environment to some extent. You know, they're certainly changing the water course in a pretty dramatic way, but they aren't emitting anything. This is the tide mill is using the using water driven by the tides um, and perhaps some human power here or there to open sluice gates if they aren't sort of automated. But uh, it's that and some gears and stone inside of a wooden structure that's functionally doing this. Now, one other thing I wanna say though about what happens with tide mills is that as you dig into the research, you see um, that some of the tide mill dikes or berms that are built as the mill dams um, and some of the excavation of the mills is actually done by enslaved peoples. You have to remember that in the 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s, Brooklyn especially was a place with a significant number of slaves. Um, so on this map, I just want to show you um, there's actually a spot here. You can probably see what looks like two mill ponds. One up at the top where it says mill <laughs> that Stefan is now indicating. And then down lower, um, there's a, a larger mill. The uppermost one is Brower's Mill or later Freak's Mill. And Brower was one of the, it was basically the first tide mill in New York colony from what we can tell. 
Um, and then the lower one is Denton's or later Yellow Mill, um, which came a bit later. Now off over to the left, there's a long stretch of tidal marshland and that is all um, something that came about later. This map is the well-known Ratzer map from 1766. Um, after this map, at some point, there's another mill pond dug in that area that Stefan just indicated, which is known as the coal mill. And with that one, we do have evidence when it's put up for auction that, quote, African labor, end quote, was used um, for the construction of that mill pond. So that, that is a term indicating at the time that enslaved people did that work. So that's one part of the story here. The other part of the story is that in Gowanus, the tide mills were deeply involved in what you may have heard of as the Battle of Long Island, or as I know it, and many of my neighbors know it, the Battle of Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> this was a conflict- Terrible of you to include all of Brooklyn, and not just <laughs> Gowanus in that. Yes. Um, try to be charitable here along the banks of this canal. Um, <laughs> So this was a battle early in the American Revolution, late August of 1776. We just passed the anniversary of that. And that battle played out right on this map. It happened at the Old Stone House, which is down in the lower right-hand corner of the map. Uh, that was sort of the crucial charge of the Maryland 400. Washington and his men are up on the heights across what at the time was Gowanus Creek and these tide mills. So as the American position collapsed in the face of the British onslaught, they, uh, the soldiers attempted to flee back across the marshes and the Browers Mill gets burnt in the course of that. And that little tide mill causeway that you can see up there was one of the paths of, of retreat. Um, and so there were, you know, the tide mills were right in the thick of this momentous battle, uh, which, you know, the Americans did not win. But the crucial thing was they also lived to fight another day. Um, and you know, there's, if you're looking for more on Gowanus Tide Mills, definitely check out the work of Iman Deagle, who is a cartographer and a fellow member of the Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club. Um, he's done extensive work on this. Also, Joseph Alex Yu, the author of the book about Gowanus. Um, definitely some, a lot more to dig into. Let's head over to Red Hook. All right. Just a short ways down the waterway. Oh, yeah, we can almost see Gowanus here on the map. <laughs> so in Red Hook, you have a number of tide mills. And the most interesting and striking thing to me is that where is Red Hook? Modern day Red Hook <laughs> is a lot of infill, you suddenly realize, because on this picture, you're seeing a lot of mill dams, you're seeing a lot of marsh, you're seeing some canals. Um, in fact, that long stringy cana uh, canal that goes through was cut in the 1600s by Brower, the miller at um, that tide mill in Gowanus as a shortcut to transport goods to Manhattan from Gowanus. But we have several mills appearing here. There's actually three of them we can see. One is Van Dyke's, which is sort of the main central one there. And that was used initially to grow or to grind uh, grain. And you know, sometimes some of these mills were sawing lumber as well. But interestingly, that there was a mill there slightly after this map that ground ginger that was imported. And that was used to make a drink, a liquor called Jake. Um, so if you're ever looking for something new to order when you're headed to the bar, ask your bartender for Jake and see what he does or she. <laughs> um, and then lower on the right here was Sebring's mill. And then way up at the top is another mill. And this is up sort of where the, the um, Red Hook container port in the bottom parts of Brooklyn Bridge Park are. And that was uh, Luqueer's mill. A lot of these mills changed names over time and changed ownership. So sometimes they're named <laughs> by successive families and then different members of those families controlled other tide mills. So it gets very confusing, especially since they existed for such a long time. Um, but that one up there was really about grinding grain for use in gin and other liquor uh, for the Pierpont distillery. And you know, what I find remarkable about the maps of Red Hook is how long some of these uh, mill ponds stayed around. Uh, I think it's into the 20s or 30s that you see remnants of this mill pond, uh, and, uh, which uh, takes up an area that's now the Red Hook Houses and the playing fields. 
Uh, you know, we read stories from the, the 40s of, of you know, kids, uh, there's sort of, there were the kids on one side of what was, uh, they actually referred to as the mill pond and the kids on the other side, you, you don't cross the, you know, you don't go to the wrong side of the mill pond, uh, that uh, these structures stayed around uh, very much into living memory. Right, right. And, you know, in Red Hook, I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, Portside, New York because the Red Hook Water Stories series that they put out online has a great deal of information and links and images about tide mills in the sort of greater Red Hook and Gowanus area. So thanks to uh, Carlina Salguero and Peter Rothenberg for a lot of work on that front. Absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that. Okay, let's uh, go back to home turf for turnstile tours. Here we are in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. <laughs> it looks just a little bit different. Uh, we don't have any graving docks just yet in 1766. But the interesting thing for purposes of our conversation today is you still have the Wallabout Bay or the place of the Walloons um, who settled along the marshy shoreline there. But over on the left, you see Mill Dam once again. And this apparently was Remsen uh, who built this and used an old sandbar there to sort of use as the body of the mill dam. And then the mill itself was up closer to, I think, Stefan, you were saying this is where about where the water treatment facility is today within the Navy Yard complex. That's right. And of course, that used to be uh, the shipways. That's where uh, Big uh, Big Mo, uh, the Missouri, was built, uh, right where there used to be a uh, tidal mill. Yes. So, of course, then there's the whole thing with uh, the fact that if this mill or this, if this mill is showing up on a map from 1766, uh, tide mills were present when the prison hulks were in Wallabout Bay, including the HMS Jersey and some of the other very notorious ships that, of course, ultimately disgorged the bodies that today are in the crypt within Fort Green Park. That is a really humbling observation. Uh, it sort of adds. You know, mills are, are, are very noisy and, uh, uh, you know, very active, and, and that really uh, adds a dimension to, to the way we think about the experience on, on, on those ships. It's, uh, it's remarkable. And uh, Andrew mentioned that we're going to look at, well, let me step back there for two seconds here. Uh, in our uh, looking at these maps, I noticed that we have we have a stream, natural stream coming to the other side of Wallabout Bay. And on some of the later maps, uh, there's a canal uh, in that stream that reaches all the way over toward the Newtown Creek. Uh, and that's one of the challenges of these maps is that they often are a little speculative. Uh, I my sense is it's not true with the uh, the tide mills so much, but uh, with a lot of the canals and sort of the more uh, aspirational architecture, uh, the uh, maps will often show things that the people want to build but uh, may or may not actually finish, which uh, seems to have been the case with that canal. Uh, the other thing that interested me, I noticed, is uh, as you go through the maps through time, uh, there's a period where the mills are all, you know, uh, highlighted. They're very, uh, the, what turns up on the map tells you about the values of the people making the map. Right. And really, the mills were really important in this time. And then as we get into the early 19th, middle 19th century, it's almost like we see uh, coal and steam power taking over as the, uh, the mills may still be there, but they're not as prominent or they're not mentioned. They're just a dot on the map. Uh, and uh, they, they sort of disappear from the cart uh, cartographic record before they uh, disappear entirely uh, or are minimized in that record before they really disappear from the, uh, the community. Great point. All right, uh, now going a little farther south into Brooklyn, we're at Gravesend Bay and uh, not a mill I know a lot about, uh, sort of unsurprised to find it here. So this is something we talked about on a recent program on the Rockaway Ferry. And uh, this is Coney Island Creek. So the NYC ferry is slated to open a new ferry to Coney Island Creek soon. So you'll, you'll go past this section. Uh, I don't know if there are any remnants of the mill that was there, but uh, 
one reason it's hard to figure that out is because it's a remnant of so many other things. It's a, <laughs> a basin full of uh, derelict vessels, old uh, uh, light ridge barges and ships that I've not found anyone who can identify. But uh, clearly this area, as we get into the, uh, the village of Gravesend, see up here, we talked about this on a previous program, uh, the, uh, the village of Gravesend laid out here on the map in this very strong square, which is still visible in the street grid today, uh, started by uh, Lady Moody, uh, a religious dissenter who uh, uh, was married to a, a baronet, I think, and then moved to, uh, the, uh, to New England. The Puritans were a little too pure for her, so she uh, <laughs> fled to Long Island and set up uh, a, a village run by a woman here in Brooklyn. Uh, right by uh, a lot of tide marshes in, and this tide mill. Step, step in, would you say that, uh, that this mill was somewhere around the site of Calvert Vox Park today? Is that about Yeah, that? yeah. So Calvert Vox Park is, is right uh, here. It's a lot of landfill, much of which came from the uh, uh, Fort Lafayette, uh, which is where the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is today, and also uh, uh, Fort Hamilton, the neighborhood, all those buildings that Robert Moses uh, got rid of to, uh, to build the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. That kind of built out Calvert Vox Park here. Yeah, got it. Yeah, fascinating place. I highly recommend visiting. And as another better look gives you a little clearer image of the Mill Pond and Coney Island Creek. And again, those salt marshes. Now to the other side of Coney Island. Uh, and this is looking at today is Jamaica Bay. Uh, I believe that's uh, Kings Highway. Isn't that what we call this today, this uh, road up here? Mm -hmm. And uh, the old city of, of Flatlands uh, and down here, we're looking at Garretson Creek, which we looked at a moment ago. And up here, there's another grist mill. And that grist mill is on the edge of what we today call Mill Basin. So Floyd Bennett Field would be down in this area. And all of this is, uh, uh, is tide marshes. There's another view with uh, Sheepshead Bay and uh, grist, that grist mill at Garretson Creek. Right, Bar and it, you know, Stefan, mentioning Mill Basin, uh, does remind me that it's important if you're out looking for tide mills to take a look at place names in New York City because, as you mentioned, there aren't that many places within what today constitutes New York City that have sufficient altitude change to allow for sort of a head of water in the traditional way where people think of a mill with a, a, a stream flowing by it or a river and that's turning a mill. You know, we don't necessarily have that. So if you are looking at maps of New York City and you see streets or, or areas that have the word mill in them, there is a high likelihood that they involved tied mills at some point in the past. So in lower Manhattan, you know, there's Mill Lane. And I actually saw an interesting picture that showed that that little lane was actually covered with, um, almost paved with millstones at one point. Oh. Which was really interesting and again that could be from uh from windmills but we'll have to dig a little bit on that uh but in Gowanus there's a mill street which is very close to Cole's mill site um you know mill rock mill basin it's definitely a key indicator if you're out there doing some sleuthing uh for where to look Absolutely. Yeah, I've noticed that you're in Queens and uh, Red Hook and and uh, similar with uh, Water Street. Of course, uh, Water Street in uh, uh, Dumbo uh, was where the uh, water used to, you know, uh, anything between Water Street and the water today is landfill. Uh, also true in Manhattan. And uh, uh, there, I believe there's one in Stapleton. Also uh, Canal Street. You know, Canal Street used to have uh, uh, it was a channelized creek, as was the Canal Street in Stapleton. So, yeah, the uh, maps, uh, you know, don't exactly lie. You know, there's a lot to be found in them and street names. So here we are. This is what uh, Mill Basin and uh, uh, Garrison Creek look like today. This is the neighborhood of Marine Park and the park itself. And this is Mill Basin. The mill, as I understand, that was in Mill Basin was located just off screen. Uh, at 36th and Avenue U. And of course, we have Floyd Bennett Field here with Jamaica Bay proper on the other side. And uh, we looked at this photo again with our cat uh, showing us the, uh, the tide mill. But we've got two more burrows to do. So 
let's uh, go on down to Staten Island, my uh, my native, my my birthplace. Okay, wonderful. Well, Staten Island, the one we're looking at here is Dongjin's Mill, uh, which I, in doing my research was originally built by Loveless, who was the same person that we know from Loveless's tavern in Lower Manhattan, as far as I can tell. Um, but then um, Dongin, of course, is like a well-known name in terms of uh, colonial leadership and the, and the like and the Dongin Oak um, from the Battle of Brooklyn. But anyway, uh, this was at the site uh, along the Kilvan Cull, um, and Staten Island had a bunch of mills, as we'll see. But this one was perhaps one of the earliest. It was along the Kilvan Cull, and it's noted multiple times that there was an inlet so boats could come right up to the mill on the water side. Um, but this was powered with the tide, but also, and, and there's several examples of this, um, and we'd have to do a little more research, but it seemed like it potentially was also using some of the stream water from coming out of the Clove Lakes. Um, That's really interesting, yeah. Huh. So they're, they're sort of doubling their, uh, their resources. So you may have a small stream, but you increase its power and the power of the tides by combining them. Correct, and there's definitely, there are examples of that. And one place where I'm in intrigued to look for more examples like that is along the Hudson. Um, there's lots of places like Sawkill Creek in, um, in Yonkers, for example, where I think forever the, and again, this, this is speculation, I will say flat out, but there's a lot of places where I think people forever have just presumed that they were stream-based mills, but they forget that the tide was acting all the way up to Albany. And so I did find evidence recently uh, that there was one tide mill off of Athens near Hudson, New York. Um, in one source. And so that's, that's inspired me to look for, for other examples along that waterway. Excellent. Do you happen to know where on the Kilvan Cull Dongan's Mill was? Um, basically, if you are at the bottom of, um, of the Clove Lakes chain of parks, yeah. you go straight out to the coast from there, that's where, you, that's where you hit it. That makes sense. Which, Great. which is not a very good uh, explanation in modern terms, but... <laughs> Well, it gives us a sense on this map here. We, uh, we can see yes. Clove Lakes Road and, uh, and something we were talking about before, of course, Staten Island has the highest point in the city. And so you do have an opportunity where there are streams to have more traditional mills, you know, possibly even overshot mills because uh, they're, the descent is, is so steep in some of these places. Uh, but I see mill written all over the place. You've got one circled over here. Yes, so that is one that we saw in the early part of the show, down near what is today the ship graveyard um, along the Arthur Kill and also the little Blazing Star Cemetery on the far southern end of Staten Island. Um, but that was Dissosway's mill. Um, and it's just to show that this mill list, or this, uh, this map rather, lists 19 mills. As you can see, some of them are way inland and they were not tide mills, but Suffice it to say that Staten Island had a significant number of mills, uh, tide mills, and a number of them were clustered here near Richmond Town on Richmond Creek, which of course flows into the overall Fresh Kills area, um, which was later landfill and then it, at some point will be a full blown gigantic park. Yeah, and knowing how extensive that tidal area is, it, I was uh, definitely looking at maps for. Uh, uh, for uh, Todd Mills in that area. Uh, Peter wants to know uh, about, uh, were any Tide Mills sawmills? Yes, they definitely were. Um, that is one part of it. I mean, often they're, often they're grist mills. That seems to be the most common for grinding grain, but definitely some sawmills as well. And there's even some stories from uh, folks who talked to their grandparents who had worked in Tide Mills um, about how they would actually cut some of the softer lumber with the earlier um, outflow. And then later as there was more tide, tidal head um, and there was more force acting on the saw in the mill, they would cut the harder lumbers. That makes sense. So he notes it's the sawmill river that's up in Yonkers. Yes, not the saw kill, but. Yeah, well yeah, that's, that's fascinating, uh, the, sort of the, the, the sort of the, uh, how uh, refined their process was and how, 
and how they were uh, adjusting to the, uh, the flow to, to make their work better. That's fantastic. Yep. So, all right, here we are, Richmond Creek. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, this is actually a shot from an old British redoubt up in the hills of Staten Island looking out over Richmond Creek. And so, Richmond Town would be off to your left from this vantage point. And this is Guyb Mill, one of several that were around Richmond Creek um, going. And, and this is another point, you know, that we've talked about, but this picture really makes it clear is that it's somewhat interesting that tide mills were some of the first places of industry, but they were often out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> they had to be where the tidal flow was at the dam. And oftentimes that was out in a sort of swampy, marshy fen land. Uh, so you have these interesting, you know, it really, by the time these mills were 150, 200 years old in the mid 1800s, uh, they were often in a somewhat dilapidated state and were these very romantic places. I was going to say, I'm surprised I haven't read more mysteries and horror stories set in tide mills. <laughs> yes, tasks, tasks yet to be done. <laughs> yeah. All right, so it looks, uh, that looks like McCombs Bridge in the background there, but we're, we're back in the Bronx. So the other, the other side of McCombs Dam was, of course, in the Bronx. That's right, that's right. There's a pond, a park there uh, today um, that at the very least has taken the Mill Pond moniker um, as its sort of signifier, which at least gives people a clue that there was once a tide mill at uh, McCombs Dam Bridge. Uh, and, and, you know, when we're saying tide mills of the Bronx with this particular one, it's a shared one with Manhattan because essentially it was, it was on both sides. But as we go along here, and I think the Bronx is actually ripe for us to find more tide mills as we dig in further. Um, during the course of this uh, exercise, I definitely learned about at least one that did not fit within any of the designations for the, uh, for the Tide Mill Institute. So this was new to them. Uh, this one, the Bronx however- is another place that has enough uh, elevation. Uh, if I recall, there was a, a mill, I want to say it was a, a snuff mill that right. the, uh, the what's now the Botanic Garden. That's right, yes. The Lorillard Snuff Mill <laughs> was, as far as I know, only a stream-based um, yeah. uh, mill. But there were tide mills, and this one is at the mouth of East Chester Creek near Pelham, uh, Reed's Mill. And I do, you know, going back to your point, Stefan, about why don't we hear of more horror stories and the like, or uh, <laughs> spooky Gothic romances happening at Tide Mills, here is candidate number one <laughs> for that story. Absolutely. That's, that's a pretty terrifying picture. <laughs> yes. Um, and then lastly, you know, we've talked in several cases about the American Revolution entwining with Tide Mills. We talked about that in Gowanus with the Battle of Brooklyn. At the Gerritsen mill, there's uh, talk about the miller having hidden his uh, millstones in the river, the Stromkill there, uh, to avoid having to work for the British, but then having to do so anyway, um, and having possibly ground grain for Washington's troop before that happened. So up in the Bronx, at the mouth of Westchester Creek near Throg's Neck, there was also an instance where the Continentals uh, you know, sort of holed up along an old mill dam and, and resisted the British. And once again, tide mills were just sort of these integral parts of the landscape in New York City. So I hope that this has given everyone, at least this is just a primer, this is just a taste. There's a lot more to dive into if you find this interesting. But I think in terms of the example it sets for green energy, where you are generating power from something that is not using fossil fuels, from the standpoint of its involvement with our history, and for its continuing influence on our urban landscape and the siting of things within the metropolis, I do think it certainly helps to have an understanding that A, tide mills existed, <laughs> what they did, how they interfaced with the rest of their times um, is a really important thing to know. Absolutely. And Andrew makes an interesting point here that uh, 
you know, uh, river mills were places that people concentrated. You, you find people coming together and uh, you have uh, villages building up around them, but that just wasn't really physically possible with the tide mill because you are in these swampy areas that are you know, mosquito infested. They've got everything wrong with them, but they're a place that we can access power. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, really thank you for uh, taking us on this tour and, uh, and uh, yeah, I think I, I agree with you that my favorite thing about this is how raw and undiscovered it is and how much room there is for people to investigate. And I hope people watching will join us and check out the Tide Mill Institute and, uh, and join in the research. And you know, if you're in a, a tidal community, uh, you know, see what you can find about your local tide mills and uh, we can help uh, uh, you know, develop new understanding about this sort of overlooked part of American history. Absolutely. And two, two other people have had one moment to mention them, just because we've mentioned a few people who've done good research around the city. Um, in Queens, Bob Singleton with the Greater Astoria Historical Society has also done a good bit of work on the Queens-based mills. And in Staten Island, Pat Salmon has done a good bit of work. So in case you're looking for people out in your borough to help you jump off into further research or gain more knowledge, please check them out. Andrew says, we love Pat. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you once again. It was, it's always a pleasure seeing you and uh, great to have you on to talk about, uh, uh, about all kinds of uh, Tidelands history and uh, bring some music with us. And uh, as, you're, as you're playing this out here, Brad, uh, folks will look forward to seeing you again on the 9th and uh, the 16th with all our upcoming shows. Uh, Brad, take it away and we'll uh, say goodbye, everybody. Sounds good. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a good day. <laughs> Take care.